time and to get to know you and meet you and to be able to share um, about, about Honduras, what God's doing in Honduras. And because of that, you get to be a part of what God is doing in Honduras. You get to go with me even though you don't have to leave Fall River and be a part of what God is doing in Honduras. Um, this morning, I'm, normally I um, don't necessarily share a lot about me, but because this is my first time here, uh, I just want to give a little bit of, of back history. And please excuse my voice, this is not my normal voice. I've been out at General Council and um, before that at our LAC regional retreat. And so two weeks of just people, people, people talking all the time. And my voice is like, yeah, it's time to be quiet. <laughs> um, but to just give you a little bit of history, uh, I have grown up, uh, I'm from Maine originally. My parents pastor up in Maine and I've grown up in the church. At the age of seven, I told my mom and dad after a missionary visiting our church, I told them that I was going to be a missionary. And then when I was 14, I went on my first ever missions trip all the way to Romania. Um, I was there after that for like the next five years. And if you talk to my leaders who took me on the trips, every trip I cried coming home. I was in the airport, just the tears, and they're like, Rachel, we have to take you home. Your mom and dad are waiting for you. Um, and so from there, uh, I, when I graduated high school, I went to Guadalajara, Mexico, and was part of a program called Engage in Missions, which is a student missions program. And I spent two and a half years down there working on my college classes online, but at the same time being able to work alongside of a, another missionary couple and just get experience actually living on the field. Um, after that, I came home. I was with my parents in the church that they were pastoring at the time, finished my degree, and then about six years passed, and then I went out again as a, a missionary associate with the Assemblies of God. I returned to Mexico, but to a different part called Guanajuato, and was there for about two years, and then transitioned to be, being fully appointed where God led me to Honduras, where I currently am. I did not choose Honduras. My plan was to head back to Mexico, and God had other plans for me. So, um, and I, I'm going to share a little bit about that this morning. How many of you like, uh, first of all, I forgot, I have a video. <laughs> I'm going to share a video with you first so that you can just kind of see a little bit, I've been in, in Honduras for four years now, and so just to give you a little glimpse of ministry down there, I'm going to share a video with you. So you can go ahead and roll the video. Sometimes I sit in all at places I have been Machu Picchu, Buenos Aires, Mexico in a few short years my life has changed so drastically Adventures for my soul penned in your love story oh. Your love shines through the smiles of your people Who find hope in the midst of hunger and war how mistaken I have been thinking I'm the blessing When they've taught me more than I could ever know And how can I fall back into my comfort zone My own warm home When I know you are calling me to seek a kingdom first And let the whole world know Our only hope To put our faith in Jesus comfort zone When the 
terror stop me from loving my neighbor Because it scares or is not convenient for me All I know is that I worship the Savior Born from two Middle Eastern refugees And how can I fall back into my comfort zone glimpse of the last four years of my life. Um, I went into Honduras, asked to be a part of their um, children's church program that was basically newly established. Uh, they had just put together a, a team, a leadership team, and people working throughout the country. They had written their own curriculum, and so to just kind of come in and, and be a support in that and helping to establish children's church throughout the country. Um, however, that is not all that I did. I was involved in, in many different things and had the privilege of teaching in the Bible school in Tegucigalpa, where I live, um, and, and teaching missions classes. And so being able to invest in Hondurans who are feeling God calling them out into to the nations and being a part of, of disaster relief. We had two major hurricanes hit the country in November of 2020, within 10 days of each other, and they took the same exact path. And so as you can imagine, there was extreme devastation up along the coast, really all over the country as the hurricane hit differently in different areas. Um, being a part of getting clean water into different communities, um, being a part of a national pastor's wives com conference, just pretty much anything and everything that was asked of me. Um, and, and it was just an honor to be there and to be a part of what God is doing in Honduras. How many of you enjoy a good story? You like to hear whether it's somebody telling a story or you enjoy reading. Most of us, we enjoy hearing a good story, right? Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning. It's the beginning of God's story. Genesis to Revelation is the unfolding of history. History in that we learn of what history is, but also his story. God revealing his plan for mankind and his invitation for us to join him in where he is working. Matthew 28, 16 through 20 says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is Jesus' invitation, God's invitation to us to join his story, to enter into his story. If you call yourself a believer this morning, if you, you are his disciple. This was not just for his his disciples then and that time that were following him, but for all of us who say, Jesus, 
I make you the king of my heart, the Lord of my life. And so it's our invitation to enter into this story. The story of Honduras. As I mentioned, I'm involved in their children's ministry, their children's church ministry. For Honduras, Honduras is the second poorest country in Central America, with Nicaragua being the first. There is extreme poverty within the country. After COVID and the two hurricanes, that poverty just increased more. As the country, when COVID happened, the entire country shut down for about two weeks. Nothing was open. And so there's this extreme poverty in the country. And the people that it affects the most are the kids, the little ones, and the youth. On top of that, Honduras is known for its extreme violence. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still, still considered this because things have changed quite a bit within the country, but there was a time where San Pedro Sula, one of the northern cities, was known as the murder capital of the world. Not just for the country, but it was known as the murder capital of the wor world because of the extremely high homicide rate within the country. And that all was coming from the gang violence that was going on. And so about nine or 10 years ago, National Assemblies of God leadership within the country began to see what was going on. They began to recognize how the poverty and how the violence was affecting their kids and their youth as gangs recruit the children and the youth. And when I went into Honduras, I went in with the, the thought and um, the idea that it was the, the people that they were recruiting was mostly the kids that you found out on the street, the kids that didn't have anywhere to go, the kids that didn't necessarily have mom and dad there to take care of them. And as I talked to leadership, they said, yes, that's true, but they're also there af going after the ones who do have family, who do come from nice homes. They wait outside of their schools. And when school gets out, they work on recruiting these young people into their gangs. And so as the church began to recognize this and what was going on, they realized that they were not doing anything. Within most of Latin America, children's ministry, youth ministry is not at the forefront. And a lot of times the thought is, well, they don't give back to the church. They're not tithing, they're not giving offerings. And so why are we going to invest in them right now? Like, let's invest in those who are, who are giving back to the church. And so as the church began to realize that they were failing in this area, leadership said, we need to do something. We need to reach the children and the youth of Honduras. And so from that was born their children's church, Iglesia Infantil. And they began to form a team, a leadership team, who then formed another team to be able to be out working all over the country. They wrote their own training material. It's 11 modules, and they do a mod one module a month, depending on the area. Some areas may do two modules every couple of months. Um, and so they put together this team and this training, and they began to go out into Honduras and to train leaders to do children's church in their local churches. We're not going out and doing ministry apart from the local church, trying to start our own thing. We are partnering with local churches and we are wanting that local church to catch the vision of reaching the children and the youth in their community. And when we talk about children's church, Sometimes people have the thought of, well, it's just, we're just getting the kids out of, out of service so mom and dad can, can enjoy and, and not, have to, not have to be shushing them all the time and worrying about how much noise they're making and so mom and dad can receive and hear the message and so let's, let's take them out and, and entertain them for a little bit. That is not what Children's Church is. Not in Honduras and not here. It is about discipling and pastoring 
these kids. And that is what our goal is. We do not start children's church in a local church just to provide entertainment for the children. These kids are being discipled. They are being pastored. They are learning how to take what they have learned and to go out and to evangelize to their friends and to their families, to their communities as well. Because they are the church. And they are the future leaders of Honduras. And if we want to see change happen within the country of Honduras, it's going to start with them. Change is going to start with them. And so that is, that is essentially what I get to be a part of. I wanna share with you two, two short stories this morning. Within, uh, within our structure of Children's Church, as I mentioned, they have to go through 11 modules. Generally, that takes about a year if they're doing it a module a month. And so that is a commitment to say, I'm gonna take a year to go through this training. And so we like to celebrate that. We like to celebrate the commitment that these leaders are making to the kids in their community to reach them. And so we always do a graduation at the end of, of each uh, training period. I had the opportunity to, to go, last year was probably one of my most crazy busy years before I left Honduras. And we had, I think, about 13 different graduations happen last year. Um, and I was at 12 of them. Um, and so last year, one of the ones that I got to go to was out on the Rio Patuca, the Patuca River. The Patuca River is one of two major rivers in Honduras. Now to get there, from where I live in Tegucigalpa, we have to drive about um, six to eight hours, kind of depending on what the road looks like at that time of year. And you get to the river, and then you get in what they call a pipante, which is a very long uh, canoe-like boat that has a motor on it. And depending on where you're going in the river, you can be on the river up to 15 hours if you were going way up into the country. There are parts of Honduras that are very rural, where there really is nothing. There's no electricity, there's no cell service, there's no internet, nothing. And this is how you get into those areas. So we got to the river and we only had to go about, I think it was about three hours um, down the river where we got out and the church was just set up off the banking, which it seemed like it wasn't very far, but the banking was literally, you had to like walk uphill like this and it was kind of switch backing up. Um, so we got up there and we, we had the graduation the following day where I learned that one of the leaders who was graduating, in order to receive his training every month or every couple of months, he walked 12 hours just to get there, and then 12 hours home. That was his level of commitment to see Jesus in the kids in his community to reach the kids and the youth of his community for Jesus and to see them discipled. How many of you walked to church this morning? How many of you had to walk 12 minutes to church this morning? Not very many. Can you imagine 12 hours just to get here for a training? That's commitment. God had called them, called him to those kids, and he was committed to reach them. That is what Iglesia Infantil is doing in Honduras. The second story that I want to share with you is that, so every year we do a leadership conference. The leadership conference was, has been going pretty much since the start of Iglesia Infantil, the children's church, and then in 
2021, we had programmed our first ever national kids conference. We were going to do four of them and it was going to be done regionally. 2021, we were still smack dab in the middle of COVID in Honduras. COVID was way worse down there, the, the curfews, the regulations, everything. We were still not allowed to meet in person. And so as we came into 2021, thinking about our, our National Kids Conference, we didn't want to cancel because it was going to be our first ever kids conference. And so as we began to plan and to figure out how we were going to do it, we decided that it was going to happen virtually. We would hold four conferences. We would do them all virtually. Um, and it meant that we really had to be creative in what we were going to do in order to be able to capture the attention of these kids that were going to sign up. As we began to prepare, one of, um, one of the other guys, he approached me and he was like, hey, Rachel, what do you think about, about possibly getting some sponsorship for, for our conferences so that we can offer it at a, at a lower price? Children's Church doesn't make any money, you guys. It doesn't make any money here in the U.S. and it doesn't make any money in Honduras. And so in order to offer a conference, we can't offer it for free because we have no money. But because we had come through COVID and we had come through hurricanes, we knew the situation, the economic situation in the country. And we wanted to make sure that we were able to offer it at a price that people could really send to their kids. And there are some families that have four, five, six kids that they're going to send. And so as he said that, we were, we were literally like a couple of months out from our first conference. And I was like, man, yeah, that would have been great. We should have thought about this like months ago. But as I began to pray about it, I felt like God put a number on my heart. And one day when I was talking to my mom, I was telling her about what was going on. And I was like, mom, it's like, I feel like, I feel like this is the number that God has given me and it's $10,000. I was like, am I crazy? I've had to raise my missions budget and all of that, but I always have at least a year in order to do that. This time I had a very limited amount of time to raise $10,000. And I remember my mom saying, Rachel, you're not crazy. If God has put that on your heart, then he is going to provide. And so I took it back to my team because this meant that we were going to set our price at about 80 lempiras which is um, like $4-ish per kid. But setting our price at that meant that if this $10,000 didn't come in, the Children's Church Department did not have the money to make it up, and Rachel did not have the money to make up the difference. And so I took it to my team and I said, hey, listen, this is what I feel like God is, is asking us to do. This is the step of faith I believe he is asking us to take. And as it was a step of faith for me, it was a much bigger step of faith for them. The team that I work with are all nationals. They're all Hondurans. They have never ever had to step out in faith like that before. And as I told them about it, I said, I don't want your answer right now. I want us to take a few days to pray about this and then we'll come back and you can, you can tell me what you think. And so we did that, and when we came back together, the resounding answer was yes, let's do it. And I said, okay, God, you better really be in this. <laughs> so I got onto my social media, I, got, I sent out newsletters, and I began to contact pastors and, and share about what God was doing in Honduras and our first ever kids conference. And I remember that within the first couple of weeks, I had the first $5,000 already. That was how quickly God brought the funds in. And so as we began to, to do our conferences, we held four of them and we held them, um, they were roughly about two months apart throughout the year so it wasn't all back to back. And between our four conferences, 
We had over 3,000 kids and leaders that joined those conferences virtually. Yeah. Now, the last several years in Honduras, within the Children's Church program, we have been, um, we always have a theme each year. And the last several years, our theme has been focused around the Holy Spirit. And that's what it was in 2021. It was focused around the Holy Spirit. And it was about His presence in me. And our goal for the conference was to see kids filled with the Holy Spirit. And so then the question became amongst, amongst the team that I was working with, well, how is that going to happen? We're holding this conference virtually. Our speaker was joining all the way from Guatemala. He wasn't even in Honduras. How is God going to touch kids? How is God going to touch leaders through a computer screen? And I remember saying, guys, that's not our problem. We can't worry about that because we serve a much bigger God than a computer or the internet. And so it was so amazing to see as we used Zoom as our platform and I loved having all of these little boxes. These 3,000 kids and leaders were spread out all across the country of Honduras. And as, as the person who was speaking began a time of, of ministering and just praying over them, all the way from Guatemala, God began to touch kids and leaders. And we began to see them filled with the Holy Spirit right where they were at, whether it was in their homes or they had gotten together in small groups, God was touching them. It didn't matter that we weren't there to put our hands on them and to pray over them. The Holy Spirit showed up and he did his job. And so that is what is going on in Honduras. That is the story of Honduras. And God is inviting us to join him. I've been reading a book called Experiencing God. And there's a quote from the book that says, throughout history, God in his wisdom has chosen to involve his people in accomplishing his purpose. God doesn't need us. He doesn't need us to do anything. But he's chosen to use us. He's chosen to involve us. And one of the other things in experiencing God, it talks about sometimes in, in ministry and in life, um, we have ideas and we're like, God, I want to serve you and, and I want to do this. And we begin to look and see what we can do and, and try to do ministry in our own way. But in experiencing God, it talks about taking a step back and beginning to look and to see where God is already working. Because God is working. He's working in our communities, he's working in our homes, he's working in our cities, in our, in our jobs, in our schools. He's already working. And so just a matter of taking a step back and seeing and asking, God, where are you working? What is it that you are doing? And then joining him in that, being a part of what he is already doing. And that is what, what we are doing in Honduras seeing where God is already working and joining and being a part. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 21 says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. I loved the worship songs this morning. They were so focused on proclaiming who Jesus is, proclaiming who Christ is. And that is what missions is about. We are telling others about Jesus. This morning, I want to invite you and to challenge you to enter the story that is taking place that is taking place in Honduras, the story that is taking place in Fall River, the story that is taking place in your home, 
or taking place in your workplace or in your school, but to enter that story. In, in Honduras, in, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, there are still unreached people groups that need to hear about Jesus. In Honduras, there is an emerging generation that needs to know the true story of Jesus. A lot of, a lot of people and a lot of resources out on the, on the internet say that Latin America and the Caribbean are reached, that is in a reached area, because they see that it is Catholic. But there is a huge difference between Catholicism here in the US and Catholicism within Latin America. With their, within their Catholicism, Jesus is either a baby or he's still hanging on that cross. And you and I know that he is neither of those things. He is risen and he is at the Father's right hand and he is working on our behalf. And so within much of Latin America, within Honduras, in their, in their Catholicism, that is what they believe. And then when you get involved into, into different people groups, they're bringing in their own religion as well that is not lined up with what we believe. And so while there is this belief that, that the, the gospel is known throughout Latin America, there are still so many that have never heard the true story that have never heard that Jesus is risen, that he no longer hangs on that cross, that he's not just a baby in a manger. There are people who believe that Mary is the one who can answer their prayers, that Mary is the one that intercedes on their behalf. But it's Jesus who intercedes on their behalf, and they need to know that. We're called to be his ambassadors and to plead on Christ's behalf, to go out and to tell his story. And it's not a fictional story. It's not something made up, but it is fact. Are you ready to enter that story and to be a part? You'll bow your heads. I'm just gonna close in prayer. Father, I thank you so much this morning for the opportunity to, to be here, to be a part of this beautiful congregation, of this beautiful church of people that you have brought together. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given each one of us to enter into the story to enter into your story and to be a part of history. God, I pray that if there is anybody here this morning that has began to feel a tug of wanting to, to enter in and, and to be more involved, God, that you would bring boldness. All too often we feel like we are not sufficient, that, that you can't use us. And it's true in ourselves, we are not sufficient but you prepare those that you have called. You go before those that you use. You go before your ambassadors. God, I pray that you would raise up this church, that you would raise up these people. And God, that they would be your ambassadors here in Fall River, Massachusetts, and throughout the world. God, that they would desire to be a part and to enter into your story. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for each one. I pray that you would bless them this morning, Father. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rachel, for that. So the Bible says, go into all the world. And, and Rachel clearly has, but not all of us can physically go. So one of the things we do is financially support it. 
and we bring on new missionaries when we can, but we can't without your faithful contribution. So we appreciate that. And if you are tugged this morning and want to give more to missions, you can do so in the offering, but you can also go online and give a reoccurring giving on the app every month missions, and then we can build a budget based on that because we'd love to bring her on and support her monthly well, in Honduras, but we have to make sure we have money in the budget. But if you feel a tugging on your heart, you can do that, that's one thing. Another thing you can do is actually go. If you feel raised up and called to missions, if you're younger or if you're older, it's never too late to go into ministry. So just let us know that, we'd love to pray with you. Another thing is, we don't have anyone that heads up our missions department here at the church. We need somebody that's willing to correspond with the missionaries, write to the missionaries, and even monthly give a report about what's going on on the mission field, and then once a year having our missions banquet. So there's lots of different ways, and then the last way is go to the park, right? That's missions, that's going. You might not be able to go to Honduras or Bolivia or Costa Rica, but you can go to Griffin Park. It's right here in the city. You can even walk there. I've done it a few times. So whatever it is, just make sure you feel God doing something and you, you obediently answer the call however you can. Amen? All right, we're just going to pray for Rachel and then you visit her at her table or have a bagel with her downstairs and uh, we'll believe God to do something special. Amen? Pastor Erica, you want to come up with me and we'll pray for Rachel. Just stretch out your hands and we'll just pray for God over Rachel. Father God, we thank you for this mighty woman of God. Lord, we just pray, Lord, you continue to bless her, guide her, anoint her, give her fresh wind and fire, God. Rejuvenate her spirit, her soul, her mind, God, as she continues to raise up her budget, God, that you'll bless her above and beyond what she could ever imagine. And Lord, as we hear reports from the field, we'll know that we have a small part in what you're doing in that country, God. Bless her today. Bless our Portuguese service next, Lord. Bless your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, this pastor loves you. I'll see you downstairs or I'll see you at the park on Wednesday. God bless you.